All right, if you got your Bibles, if you want to turn to John chapter 8. With Nathan and Rod being out, they didn't leave me specific instructions. I had to continue with Acts, so we'll be in John chapter 8 this morning. So I, I will make a small confession. If this happens to be a shorter sermon, I uh, was talked into getting donuts this morning. So I'm like really amped up on sugar and coffee this morning. Um, but hopefully, hopefully everything goes good. Uh, it's good to see everybody here as well. Uh, but we'll start in verse 31. We'll go through 38. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is this that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So if, if anybody here is coming to Wednesday nights, you'll know I've started this one a little different. Wednesday nights, I usually pose a question, something to kind of get you thinking about what the message is going to be. I felt we needed to read the word first to see who got excited over that, who got excited over knowing that when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. It was awful quiet. Sometimes I think we read the Bible so often, we read the same passages so often that we forget the true weight of it, that we forget exactly what it's saying in those passages. This would be one of them. We may have a particular verse or a particular passage that we call our favorite because at one time, God spoke tremendously through that verse or that passage to us. But we've read it so much now that it's lost that punch. It's lost that pizzazz. We don't get excited over it anymore. And I had titled this sermon, Does God's Word Still Excite You? And I wrestled with that one word, excite. Because does it still move you? Does it still give you chills when you read it? Does it still bring tears to your eyes when you read it? Do you still believe every truth that is in this book? The Holy Spirit helped me settle on excite because that encompassed all of that. If you're not excited you won't be moved. If you're not excited, you won't get chills. If you're not excited, you won't shed a tear. So let's break this passage down and see some of the things that God is telling us here, some of the things that should get us excited. So we see a particular section in here where he says that the slave doesn't stay in the house forever, but the son does. And that's verses 33 through 35. It said, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. If you know anything we always look at slavery as a bad thing and in this case it still is because he's talking about being a slave to sin 
And anybody who's a slave to sin doesn't get to stay in the house forever. In Romans 6, 15 through 16, Paul tells us, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So when we present ourselves, that's the same thing as saying, what do we surrender to? What do we submit ourselves to? If we're always surrendering to sin, anytime something happens during the day, if we're always surrendering to sin, then we're a slave to sin. And Jesus tells us here in John chapter 8 that a slave to sin can't stay in the house. So we don't want to do that. We want to surrender ourselves to righteousness. We want to surrender ourselves to Jesus. In Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit yours again to the yoke of slavery. So stop surrendering to sin. There's no need in it. Your chains of slavery to sin have been broken you don't have to choose that path anymore you have a choice that choice is very clearly shown in Zechariah 3 if anybody's familiar with that Zechariah was given a vision and in that vision Joshua the high priest was standing had Satan on one side and he had Jesus on the other. And Satan was constantly just accusing, saying all kinds of bad things about him. But Jesus come in, rebuked Satan, gave Joshua new clothes because it said he had new or had old stained clothes. The stains were representing sin and all of that. Jesus took all that sin from him, gave him new clothes, made him holy, made him righteous. But that's, that's what we face every day, that scene. It's not a one and done. Okay, I repented my sins one time. I got baptized. I'm good for the rest of my life. We see that every day, every situation. Do I choose Satan or do I choose Jesus? Do I choose to go about this the way evil would or do I choose to go about this the way that God would? We have to make that choice every day in every situation that we face. So why would we go back to sin? Why would we choose that if we have been set free from it? Right? And why does Jesus set us free? Why does he go through the trouble of freeing us from sin? In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, we find that answer. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So propitiation is a big word. Um, Admittedly, I had to look that one up to see what it meant. But it just means that he satisfied God's wrath for us on the cross. So the wrath that we were supposed to take for our sins, Jesus satisfied that on the cross. What a great love that is. To die for someone who is completely against you. But that's what Jesus did for all of us. Another verse that sums that up really good, and I think this is another verse that we take for granted because we've probably all memorized it at some point, and that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We have read that and memorized it. I'm sure we all can speak it. But to stop and think about it, he loves us so much that he would give his only son to save us. I, I'm personally not a parent. I haven't been blessed in that way. But those of you who are, would you give your kid for somebody else's sin? God did. But he set us free because he loves us. He loves us more than any of us can ever imagine. You just take the greatest amount, the greatest number that you can think of, and it's more than that. It's way more than that. And the whole theme of First John, as you read through that entire book, the, the big overarching theme for that is God's love for us. It's his heart towards us. And it is an absolutely awesome book. And if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. Just really slow and look at everything that's said in there because that's as close as we're going to be able to get to understanding just how much God loves us. Something else we see from this passage in John chapter 8. In verses 31 and 32, it says, So Jesus answered, or excuse me, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in 36, he says, So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, if we're really looking at this, if we're really trying to get closer to God, something we will notice, everything in these verses is singular. You. You. Not y'all. He's not talking to the group. He's talking to each one individually. You will know the truth. You will be set free. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when you pair that with John chapter 8, Jesus is telling us the same thing twice because he says, I'm the truth. And in John 8, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So you will know Jesus and Jesus will set you free. The son will set you free. He has to tell us the same thing twice because sometimes, and especially the Pharisees back then, could be a little hard-headed and they needed to hear the things twice. But it's all singular form. Even in John 14, it's singular form. So what does that mean? What can we take from that? There's no Groupon for heaven. It's a single file line is what we can take from that. No matter what family you came from, no matter what your heritage is, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is your personal relationship with Jesus. And we get a very good example of that in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So if you read that whole story, because I know that's just one verse, but if you read that whole story, there's a grandfather, a father, and a grandson. The grandfather was evil and wicked. The father was righteous, and the son was evil and wicked. And God was telling Ezekiel that it doesn't matter what the grandfather does, that his sins will not be held against the father who was considered righteous. At the same time, the grandfather and the grandson could not borrow, could not take away, could not steal the father's righteousness. His salvation is his alone. 
just like your salvation is yours alone. You cannot impart that to anybody. You cannot give it to your kids. You cannot give it to your parents. They have to come to a relationship to Jesus for themselves. At the same time, y'all don't have to answer for my sins. I don't have to answer for your sins. So that can be good. It can also be bad, depending on what you've done and where you're at. Do you truly know Jesus? Have you truly given your life to him? Which brings up another question that we can take from this. How do we know we've been set free? How do we know we've received that salvation? We can find that in 1 John as well. In chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, it says, We know that we have passed out of death into life. So we've passed from death to life. We've received salvation because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So, Right here, John tells us it's a heart thing. If we have passed from death to life and we have received salvation, we now love freely. We love all of God's children freely, without exception. And it says in verse 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This goes back to how much Jesus loves us. He laid his life down for us willingly. He didn't have to. He did it because he loves us. How many of us can say that there's somebody here right now that we would lay our life down for? And it might be easy because you might think, well, I would lay my life down for my spouse, for my children. But what about the person on the other side of the room that you don't really know? What about people at other churches? What about God's children that are at other churches? Because it says brothers. It doesn't say just our church. How many of us would willingly lay our life down so that any of God's children could have a chance to go to heaven? In 1 John Five verses 1 and 2, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So when we love God, his love will flow freely through us to all of his children. And the only way it won't do that is if we choose to put those chains of sin back on and we distract ourselves with that. So why would we put those on? Why would we go back to that? There's so much in this passage and It, it just, I don't know, it fits right along with, with the songs that were chosen for today. One of them said, open my eyes and wonder, show me who you are. Fill me with your heart. Love me. I can't read my own hand, right? Lead me to those around me. Yeah, I, I, it was dark. I couldn't hardly see. So I got horrible handwriting. But open my eyes. 
What is he trying to do here? He's trying to open our eyes with his word. Because when we pray, that's us talking to God. When we read God's word, that's one way that he talks to us. That's one way that he opens our eyes. So why do we skim over stuff? Why do we not take our time when we read? Why does it not excite us? If it excited us, we would slow down and read. We would want to see everything that God has in his word for us. Another one of the songs said, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more. If you're excited, you want more. You don't want less. You don't want to skim through it. You want more. You want to take your time. You want to see what he's telling you. You want to see every little thing that he has. But we can see that there's a lot more from this passage. A lot more than what we first took from it. But isn't it such great news, though? Isn't it such great news that Jesus has set us free? And we don't have to go back to sin. We don't have to choose that path. We can choose him. We have that choice now. We're not a slave to sin. And that is so exciting. And I don't know if I'm the only one that's excited by that. But it really does make me excited to know I don't have to choose that anymore. I have a choice. And it makes me excited anytime I read in God's word because this book is full of truth. Nothing but the truth. It tells us what happened. It tells us what's happening now. And it tells us what's going to happen. So when I read this, I can't help but to get excited. I can't help but to look at this and say, I know what's coming. Between here and there, I know he's got me. So I'm looking forward to that down there because that down the line is awesome. And that really gets me excited. Paul asks a very good question in Galatians 4, verses 6 through 9. He says, and because you are... Excuse me. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? How can you turn back to that? Knowing all the goodness of God, knowing everything that he's done for you, knowing how much he loves you, why would you choose that? Why would you go back to that? Why would you let that fire inside of you die down to the point that you lose sight and you go back and you put those chains on. I'm thinking, this is just coming to mind, this ain't even in my notes, but when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, there's a particular point in that story where they were mumbling and grumbling and they said, why don't we just go back to Egypt? They had lost their faith or they had very little faith left, and they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to slavery. Why would we do that? Why do that? Why can't we learn from their mistake and say, okay, I don't want to do that again. I want to get better. I want to continue to grow. I don't want my fire to die. One of the things... When God looks down and he sees us returning and putting those chains back on, it reminds me of Proverbs 26, 11. It says, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. 
when we go back to the things that we know aren't right, it's no different than that gross scene of a dog returning to his vomit. It's a fool returning to his folly. And when God looks down and he sees us and he's, oh, you woke up hungover and now you're going to drink some more to cure the hangover. Dog vomit. Dog vomit. Oh, you went and you slept with some random guy and you feel bad and now the next weekend you're going to do it again. Dog vomit. We don't have to do that. Jesus has broke those chains. We don't have to go back to that. So why do we keep going back to that? I can't answer that question for you. I could answer it for myself, but I can't answer it for you. That's something that you would need to pray about, to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance on. Why do we, like the Israelites, get more excited over worldly things instead of what we know God has planned for us in the future? Why do we do that when we know we have been set free from sin? We have been set free from all of our generational curses, from all of our iniquities, from all of our wrongdoings, from everything. Jesus has set us free from that. That should excite us. That should get us built up. We should be saying amen, clapping, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, you've set me free. And now I don't have to go back to that. So stop going back. Just stop. We can do all things through Christ. So stop. Just stop. Stop believing the lies of the enemy. Because when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And if that doesn't excite you, if it doesn't move you, make you want to tell everyone, what are you ashamed of? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am excited. I am moved. I am brought to tears. And I am filled with joy by his gospel. Because like Job said, I know, I don't think, I don't feel, I don't assume. I know my Redeemer lives. And I know how this story ends. And I'm so excited that Jesus has set me free. And I don't know how to convey my excitement any more than that. And I don't know how to get you guys excited other than to read God's word. I I was wondering why he wanted me to end with these four scriptures. But these four scriptures, if these don't put some excitement in you, if these don't rekindle that flame in your heart for Jesus, something's wrong. Romans 8, 38 through 39, for I am sure, I don't, again, I don't think, I don't feel, I don't assume, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Nothing can separate us. As powerful as Satan thinks he is, he cannot take us out of God's hand. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No matter where you go, God is with you. He is right there next to you, guiding you, leading you helping you to get through all the troubles of this world. Why be afraid? 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, 
whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Friends, he won't speak a word. As soon as his foot sets down on the Mount of Olives, he'll breathe, and it's over. He won't have to speak a word, which goes back to Joshua. If our God is that powerful, why are we afraid of anything in this world? Revelations 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's what is going to be in the end. No pain, no suffering. All of this that we see here will be gone. There's no need to worry about any of this. The only thing to worry about is where our hearts are with Jesus. Because that will determine our eternal life, whether it be in heaven or hell. And if we are right with Jesus, if our hearts are right with him, then everything in this book should excite us. Everything in here should motivate us to keep going, to keep pushing forward, to keep coming to church every single time those doors are open, to keep fellowshipping with all the brothers. Because once he sets us free, we are free indeed, which means you can have salvation through Jesus. You can have salvation through Jesus. You and you too can have salvation through Jesus. We all have salvation through Jesus. And we all should be so excited. We all should be jumping for joy every day because every day that passes, we are one day closer to standing before him, to seeing him with our own eyes. I don't know when that day will be, but I know every day that passes, I'm one day closer, and I'm that much more excited. And I just want to end with a quote from Francis Chan. It says, the world needs Christians who don't tolerate the complacency of their own lives. Have we become complacent enough that God's word doesn't excite us, that it doesn't move us, that we don't have a tear brought to our eye when we read it? Do we feel no conviction anymore when we read it? Just something to think about as we go through this week. And before I close this in prayer, I just want to say if anybody needs prayer afterwards we're going to play some music and if you would like to come up we can pray together but I just hope that from this everyone has that fire reignited in them has that excitement put back in them and that we're not just going through the motions anymore Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we just want to say thank you, Lord, for this day that you blessed us with. Thank you for giving this opportunity to gather in your name. Thank you for being here with us and helping us to understand your word. And we thank you so much, Lord, for moving and helping everyone to see the lessons and the things that you wanted them to see. And, Lord, we just ask that as we go through our weeks that you... Help us to remember what you told us here today. Help us to rekindle that fire and rekindle that excitement. Help us to get that joy back that makes us want to draw closer to you, that makes us want to spend more time with you. And just help us to remember all the things that are coming in the end and how great those are and how awesome you're going to have it everything in the end and help us stay focused on that and not worry about things in this world but help us Lord to fan our flames back up for you 
And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.